people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India and Russia held a symbolic and significant premier-level meet in Indian capital, New Delhi. President Vladimir Putin met Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the two sides held their maiden 2 plus 2 dialogue to provide a further impetus to the ties. Contracts, majorly the defence ones, were signed and both of them committed to deepen their alliance in the face of emerging crises in Afghanistan and possible threats in the Indo-Pacific. Amid chaos and controversies around the Indian purchase of the Russian S-400 air defense system and a consistently deteriorating situation in Afghanistan, two key global players, India and Russia, held a bilateral meet in the Indian capital, New Delhi. The meeting between Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Russian President Vladimir Putin was more than just significant as it was the first time in over a year when President Putin travelled to any country for a bilateral summit. The two leaders discussed and deliberated on the prevailing situation in Afghanistan and committed to strengthening efforts in dealing with the unfolding crisis. The two leaders also emphasized the bilateral bond that was strengthening and no external influence despite both countries' different diplomatic preferences had been able to dent their partnership. COVID-19 is a very important part of the COVID-19 and the COVID-19 and the COVID-19. We have not come to our special and privileged strategic partnership Several experts have opined that Russia wants to assure India that no engagement of Moscow with any other country will affect the decades-old camaraderie between the two sides. Both Washington and Beijing have been trying to form closed groups of allies for their preferred global order. And India is appearing to be in a different group than Russia. Vladimir, however, reiterated that India is a special partner for Russia and will remain so. The two countries also held their maiden 2 plus 2 dialogue, the one which is referred to as the real nut and bolt exercise, where both sides signed as many as 28 pacts. The procurement of over 6 lakh AK-203 assault rifles through Indo-Russia Rifles Private Limited that will be manufactured in India was signed. An agreement on the program for military technical cooperation from 2021 to 2031 and the 20th India-Russia Intergovernmental Commission of Military and Military Technical Cooperation were also signed. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov also praised the Indian side for not giving in to the US pressure and threats while purchasing the S-400 system. Deal is being implemented. Uh, we witness uh, attempts on the part of the United States uh, to undermine this cooperation uh, and uh, to make India obey the American orders, uh, to follow the American uh, vision of how this region uh, should be should be uh, developed. And our Indian friends uh, clearly and firmly explain that they are a sovereign country, and they will decide on whose. Uh, weapons to buy and who is going to be a partner of India in this and other areas. It is confirmed, and it was mentioned today as well, 
that the Russian-Indian relations have been characterized and remain specially privileged strategic partnership. Indian Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar also highlighted the unfolding crisis in Afghanistan and in different parts of the region and expressed the need for greater cooperation between the two sides. But the long-standing challenges remain even as new ones emerge. Prominent among them are terrorism, violent extremism and radicalization. The situation in Afghanistan has wider repercussions, including for Central Asia. West Asia or the Middle East continues to present hotspots. Maritime security and safety is another domain of shared concern. We both have a common interest in ASEAN centrality and ASEAN driven platform. The two sides have also committed to working extensively in the direction of boosting trade between them. As per Indian figures, bilateral trade during April 2020 and March 2021 amounted to $8.1 billion. Indian exports amounted to $2.6 billion, while imports from Russia amounted to $5.48 billion. A new trade target of $30 billion by 2025 was also mentioned. The two sides say that they will develop a comprehensive relationship in times to come and will live up to the special status they have given to the nature of the bond they share. Moving on. The mob lynching of a Sri Lankan in the name of blasphemy in Pakistan has shaken everybody's conscience. People world over are still in shock. This wasn't the first incident and the prevailing situation in the country is a clear sign that it won't be the last. Park government might have taken a few steps in order to control damage, but regular occurrences of such incidents have already put it across as the most unsafe country for minorities around the world. A pall of gloom descended over the family after the Sri Lankan factory manager, who was killed in a shocking and deadly mob attack in Pakistan after being accused of blasphemy, was laid to rest. A mob of factory employees in Pakistan's Punjab province tortured and burned Priyanta Kumara on 3rd December, alleging he had committed blasphemy. People took part in a Buddhist funeral ceremony before family members of Kumara carried his casket to the local cemetery. The factory manager is survived by his wife and two sons. Grieving family has called the incident inhumane and is pleading for justice. What I want to tell that, that as a human being, to kill an animal, we think twice. And while one killing animal also, then we will not kill like this because it is brutally murdered and beaten to death and then it is okay burn the body some people are telling that live the Sri Lankan official in a diplomatic statement said the relations between the two countries are not going to be affected by the incident we are very confident that uh, this particular incident will be handled by the government of Pakistan in a manner that the justice will be given to the victim's family and the children. This statement was released after the incident was condemned by rights watchdogs including Amnesty International and drew intense response from politicians, celebrities and journalists on social media. Pakistan's ruling party's vice president, Arshad Dad, said the nation was ashamed of the incident. Although more than 100 people have been arrested in Pakistan and Prime Minister has publicly apologized for the same, but things are not appearing to be changing anytime soon. The blasphemy law in the country has a number of components that justify such acts and the government has done nothing about it. And when it dared on few occasions, the Islamic fundamentalists pushed them back. 
and it is the successive governments in Pakistan that have provided platform, promoted or have taken support of these hardliners to form the government. As of now, there is not even one party in Pakistan which can claim of being fundamentalist free. Experts say in such circumstances, it is nearly impossible that Pakistan is going to witness any change at societal level and minorities are feeling safe anytime soon. Moving on, the bilateral milestones that India and Nepal have achieved were recently recognized by both sides in a virtual conference organized for Nepal's reconstruction post-2015 earthquake. Nepalese President Vidya Devi Bhandari and Indian Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar presided over the meeting. India, which committed a billion-dollar assistance post-earthquake devastation in 2015, has reiterated its position on further enhancing its efforts to secure a better life for Nepalese citizens. Indian External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar, while addressing a virtual international conference on Nepal's reconstruction, said that New Delhi was committed to bringing health and happiness to the lives of all Nepalis who were affected by the massive 2015 earthquake. Jay Shankar said the targets achieved so far were substantial. The construction of 50,000 owner-driven houses in Gorkha and Nuwako districts under Indian assistance has been completed. Over the last five years and more, India has substantially fulfilled a commitment under various priority sectors identified by the government of Nepal. I take this opportunity to share we have completed construction of 50,000 owner-driven houses in Gorkha and Novakot district under Indian assistance. The projects in remaining sectors of health, education and culture are also under progress. Government of India is funding reconstruction of 70 schools and a library, 132 health facilities and 28 cultural heritage sector projects in various earthquake affected districts of Nepal under a US dollar 150 million grant with the estimated cost of US dollar 112 million. He also congratulated the government of Nepal for organizing the event, which he said provided a platform to deliberate upon the lessons from the 2015 earthquake. He also emphasized that India's development cooperation with Nepal is multifaceted and multidimensional and has stood the test of time. Addressing the event, Nepal President Bidya Devi Bhandari urged everyone to protect the country from disasters and thank the international community for the help extended at the time of crisis. <laughs> India had pledged $1 billion assistance to Nepal post the havoc wrecked by the 2015 earthquake. Since then, it has been vigorously working on multiple projects in order to provide a better and dignified life to citizens who were rendered homeless due to the tragedy. While millions of dollars flowed in under international assistance to provide rehabilitation to thousands who were rendered homeless post-disaster, the Indian contribution in the rebuilding exercise has been instrumental. New Delhi, which is involved at several developmental fronts with Nepal, including those of developing railways and laying off gas lines among many, has committed to assist Kathmandu at all levels in order to provide additional impetus to the decade-old partnership between the two.
now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. Calling the diplomatic boycott of Beijing Winter Olympics by Australia, Britain and the United States mistaken acts, Chinese Foreign Ministry has said that they will have to pay the price for the same. The United States was the first to announce a boycott, saying its government officials would not attend the February 4 to February 20 games because of China's human rights atrocities. China has denied any wrongdoing in Xinjiang, home to the Uyghur Muslim minority, and said allegations of rights abuses were fabricated. Beijing authorities said the United States, Britain and Australia are facing a loss of moral authority and credibility by using the Olympics platform for political manipulations. Canada has also joined the group that has boycotted the Games, prompting Beijing to refer it as political posturing and a smear campaign. Relations between Beijing and Washington deteriorated sharply under former U.S. President Donald Trump and the Biden administration has maintained pressure on China. Aeon Group in Japan has announced to spend 1% of its annual profit on socially driven causes. It includes a scholarship for foreign students. This year's virtual scholarship seminar was held with a tree planting ceremony which aims to promote environment conservation and harmonization with natural resources. Aeon One Person Club intends to strengthen ties and encourage social interaction among students. The students published a report on environment conservation and learned about Aeon's initiative. ガクブ、またあ分野が近くても同じような目標に対して話し合える This is a pine tree which was planted three years ago. Aeon Group pays continuous attention to the growth of trees in the Aeon Forest along with paying attention to the growth of youngsters. Yokohama is a lively and welcoming city. It boasts of recreational destinations, sports, events and a wide array of tourist attractions. This is a panoramic view of a night in Yokohama. The Minato Mirai area is illuminated with lights. The lighting of the Yokohama Harbour is celebrated through an event named Yori no Yo, which is organized in the months of November and December. At least 30 spots in the city are lit up and are popped up with music. The big bridge terminal for international passenger boats changes its color of lights. This light and music show is the main attraction of Yokohama City. The big dome at Newport Center Square was also decked up with lights. This scene was a treat to the visitor size. The dome's diameter is 20 meters. Visitors can enjoy walking around the dome along with watching the dome changing its color. This scene is possible due to cutting edge technology. The night view of Yokohama and the lightning event at the port provides visitors with beautiful scenery and an experience of a lifetime. Moving on, let's have a look at the mesmerizing Konak Festival of Odisha. Held in the backdrop of Mammoth Sun Temple, the festival recently witnessed its 32nd edition. Along with it, the Konak City also hosted the 12th edition of the International Sand Art Festival, enabling visitors to witness both the brilliant showcase of art at the same time. Decked up with colourful lights and glittery artistic pieces, the way to the exquisite open-air auditorium, situated in the backdrop of Konak Sun Temple, was casting a magical spell on visitors. Popularly known as Natya Mandir, the auditorium is famous for playing host to the famous Konark Dance Festival every year. 
jointly organized by Odisha Tourism and ODC Research Center since 1989. The five-day cultural extravaganza aimed to boost tourism in Konark along with preserving and increasing the reach of Indian folk dance forms. <laughs> This time, amid the pandemic, authorities organized the festival with COVID-19 protocols in place. In spite of the COVID pandemic, uh, state government has uh, organized this uh, uh, classical dance festival this year with all the COVID protocols and there is uh, very good uh, performances. And, uh, a large number of guests have come from outside also to witness this uh, festival. This is going on for several decades and the uh, state government is uh, continuing this tradition. The event saw some of the mesmerizing choreographies in classical dance forms of India including Odyssey, Kathak, Satriya and Bharatnatyam. A spellbinding performance was presented by renowned choreographer Anita Sharma and her troupe from Assam. They performed Satriya, which is also pronounced as Hotriya, and is highly devotional in character with a predominant spiritual aspect. The troupe amazed the spectators with its eight dance recitals that were dedicated to Lord Krishna like Krishna Vandana, Leela Govindam and Bhatima. I want to thank Orissa Tourism for inviting us to this beautiful, magnificent dance festival to perform our beautiful Hotria tradition. And after the COVID-19, we perform first time in this big festival and we artists always love to perform on stage in front of uh, the audience because we dance, we perform for audience only and in land of Jagannath, we offer our uh, dance today to Lord Jagannath, to Surya uh, Devata. Alongside Konark Festival, International Sand Art Festival also captured the major attention of the crowd at Chandrabhaga Beach. Around 100 artisans from across the country participated in the festival and created sculptures on relevant themes like ecotourism and environment. In these many years, both the Konark Festival as well as International Sand Art Festival have carved out a niche of their own in the country's annual carnival calendar by providing a wonderful opportunity to the budding artists to make their presence felt on the international performing arts arena. Konark Dance Festival popularizes the classical, folk and tribal dance and music of India. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.